Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, let me begin by apologizing for not being with you at the Yale Forestry School for this very important and fascinating conference. Jacob Scher was kind enough to send me a few questions with which I might be able to offer at least a few thoughts that amongst the many of you who are assembled there and have so much experience and also track record in this domain um, may perhaps provide some stimulus and some reflections on where we are today and what will happen next. One aspect is the departure point of 1992, the concept of sustainable development, the Rio Earth Summit, the Brundtland Report. I think we often underestimate how important 1992 was as a way of consolidating a new discourse on development. The three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental, were an acknowledgement that we had to change the way we looked at development. And certainly over the last 20 years, I think we have seen an extraordinary amount of creativity, innovation, and also diversification of pathways in this sustainable development agenda. What clearly is our greatest challenge today is the recognition that with all the great ideas and all the great initiatives, in the year 2013, we are still moving in the wrong direction. Indeed, the concept of living in the age of the Anthropocene, I think, is one that we should continually reflect on, because it has something to do also with human consciousness and the ability to appreciate quite how different the future agenda for humanity will be in terms of where we are today. As a human species with 7 billion people, soon 8, 9, 10 billion people, we are changing the fundamental life support systems on our planet. Another way to look upon it is that one day historians will write about the fossil fuel age of history of mankind on this planet. It will have been two, three, maybe 400 years which will have changed the future of this entire planet in the context of millions of years of evolution. And here we are trying to struggle with a sense of how do we transform our economies, our societies towards a low carbon pathway. Our ability to think of the ability to change direction is also constrained by dogmas and paradigms. We have lived ever since the Industrial Revolution with the notion that somehow economic development will always come at the expense of environment and natural resources, our ecosystems. And quite frankly, that paradigm and that dogma is still very prevalent today. But what has changed since 1992 is the recognition, partly based on science and information and data becoming available as never before, in people's minds that the imperative to change is now becoming self-evident. Self-evident not only in the traditional sense of an environmental agenda that began very much at the local level, the destruction of a forest, a wetland, pollution incidents. We are today looking at a planetary agenda. We are looking at planetary boundaries. And we are beginning to realize that progress in terms of moving forward in the coming years will have to evolve also from the 1992 departure point. It is not a north-south agenda anymore. And let us again recognize that the Rio summit in 2012, despite some of the disappointments it perhaps brought to those who looked for a transformative summit, has given us a very interesting signal. The negotiation of sustainable development goals, the post-2015 development agenda, are already indicative of a very changing set of parameters and I would argue even the emergence of a new paradigm. The principle of universality, the fact that in Rio the 10-year framework program for sustainable consumption and production was actually one of the few things indeed adopted and approved, is a signal that the discussion about sustainable development will not only have to focus on developing nations anymore, but will increasingly also have to return to a global agenda, a global compact on development in which actions and decisions and consumption production patterns in the North are as much part of a future development and sustainable development agenda in the multilateral context as are the decisions and the priorities of developing economies. How does our architecture that we have at our disposal today respond to these challenges? Well, first of all, let us recognize that there is a great deal of doubt about the functionality, the efficacy, and also the promise that our institutional architecture holds for the future. Whether it is the Bretton Woods institutions which before the financial crisis themselves were being questioned in terms of their relevance and certainly the priorities and orientations under which they were working, or the United Nations system <coughs> as a whole, which has increasingly found itself more caught in a north-south development cooperation mode than really aspiring to the principle of a United Nations acting on the major challenges that we as sovereign nations, as societies face, and where collaboration and cooperation are fundamental principles and enable us to make progress. Indeed, the United Nations system as a whole has found itself increasingly also reflecting more 
the differences and divisions amongst nations than being the place where unified and progressive policy making emerges. The 1960s and 70s were an era where the United Nations General Assembly and many of the governance fora that the United Nations provided to the community of nations were progressing the agenda. Today, whether it is in the trade domain, in the climate change domain, in human rights, in many other areas, we often find that debates in our multilateral fora are more a testimony to those things which divide us rather than unite us. Is it just a matter of architecture or is it also a matter of understanding what has happened to the world? What has changed since 1992 is known to many of you. A geopolitical, a geoeconomic, and I would argue also a geoeconomic change has taken place that has fundamentally redefined the forces both in the negotiating arena, the political interests, the economic interests, but it has also put a central question in all these negotiation processes. What is the shared interest we are negotiating for? What is the advantage of trying to reach legally binding agreements, multilateral environmental agreements, conventions, protocols, in terms of the national interest, which at the end of the day, despite all dreams of a unified global community of citizens and nations, will remain for the foreseeable future the litmus test by which every country will determine whether it wants to be part of a global commitment. Our climate change negotiations are an interesting example. Many still view Copenhagen as a failure, and in some ways it was a failure to reach a legally binding agreement. The interesting fact is that both in the run-up to Copenhagen and with all the action that the IPCC, the UNFCCC, and much of the work of science and also of economists and of business leaders has generated, we could argue that in the year 2013, the world is actually doing more in terms of climate change actions and low carbon economy transitions than was even envisaged in the targets and objectives of the agreements that were on the table in 2009. It is an experience that we also share in the United Nations Environment Program. A number of voluntary initiatives or coalitions of countries that have come together to address certain challenges have emerged in recent years I would argue not as an alternative to global frameworks, but perhaps as a stepping stone towards them. Whether it is the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, whether it is the Enlighten Initiative, um, whether it is also our initiatives to reduce fuel, to achieve greater fuel efficiency, for instance, or whether it is the Partnership for Action on the Green Economy. It is in the discourse around the green economy that I believe we have also learned a great deal about where the environmental and also social dimensions of sustainable development need to focus on. Bill Clinton once said it's the economy is stupid. I think if equity and sustainability objectives are going to become more realistic and also achievable in the future, and let us also be clear, transformation is in many ways going to be the guiding principle. We are talking about scalable changes that need to occur in the domain where the paradigm of the 20th century is still the dominant one. The economy, defined in very narrow parameters such as GDP growth, for instance, is simply not able to capture, but more importantly, not able to facilitate and enable actors to make these transitions happen. Public finance models remain very much at the core of international negotiations, yet we know that investments in the energy sector, in terms of food security, in terms of the future of our economies in general, will have to bring the private financing dimension much more into the equation. Capital markets um, and also finance ministries are at the core of being able to retool and recalibrate the economic signals that will allow these transitions to happen. Perhaps some of these voluntary initiatives um, and also coalitions are a way of creating confidence and trust that actually these changes are possible, that certain countries are able to move faster or are willing to move faster. We need to explore and learn from them and we need to also appreciate that at the end of the day, our context within which we are trying to make transformation happen is dictated by fact. It is no longer a matter of having a more qualitatively superior development path. There will be no development in the future if we cannot tackle some of these dimensions that we have now brought together under the sustainable development paradigm. The next test for that will be the Sustainable Development Goals. They are perhaps the beginning of a new global development compact in which countries rich and poor, industrialized and still more agrarian will have to come together with a set of shared objectives, also informed by science and by a commitment and confidence that indeed we are building a global economy which is based on the principles of sustainable development rather than on the single driver that so often has dominated our relations amongst nations in recent years competition. Multilateralism, the institutions, the architecture, 
but also the parameters around which we negotiate must bring to the foreground the benefits of cooperation and also the benefits of acting in unison rather than in competition or in isolation or in smaller blocks. That, I believe, is perhaps one of the drivers and one of the challenges that we need to address in the coming years if indeed the notion of a multilateral architecture in which not only governments but also the private sector, civil society will play a fundamentally different role than in the past. I hope that in the coming days with all the wonderful brains that you have assembled you will be able to distill some of these lessons and also provide us with reflections because the world is in a sense in a state of suspended animation when it comes to collective action. We have a vacuum. It is in part defined by the emergence of new economies, of new actors, which is a good thing. But can we actually adapt our institutions and our agendas to capture that reality and that diversity? It is only in the principle of accepting diversity that any scope and prospect for acting in unity will emerge. Thank you very much. Again, I'm so sorry not to be with you because I would have loved to be in these sessions that you will be holding, but um, it is not always possible to be in two places at one time. Have a wonderful conference and please inspire us for what we need to do and what we need to focus on in the years to come. Thank you.